I let him tear apart everything that I was doing so I can get back to the foundations of the business. Because you and I both know that take technology away, the foundations of this business haven't changed since 1965. For the most part, they are still the same. Welcome back to Talent Hunters, powered by MRI Network, where each week we talk with the world's top talent strategists and executive recruiters. If you want to build talented teams that drive your company to big goals and big growth, then this podcast is for you. And now let's join the conversation with today's episode of Talent Hunters. This is Vince Holt with Talent Hunters. Today we have the incredibly focused and successful Chris Hines, president of Westport One in St. Louis, Missouri. Chris started 27 years ago as an account executive. Today, he is the president of Westport One. Welcome, Chris. Thank you so much for having me, Vince. Uh, Looking forward to this. Chris, we go way back. But what I'd like you to do is tell the audience a little bit about your background and really what got you to where you are today, because you started as an account executive and today you're the owner. That's right. Yeah, it, it, it's crazy because it goes back to the 20th century. It's cr- it's funny to think of it in that perspective, but we're in a whole different century of when I began. Uh, my background coming out of college was in a, of advertising and sales, and I was working for Pitney Bowes, and one of my really good friends um, got recruited to a pharmaceutical company, and it sounded so glamorous. So I asked my buddy, hey, can you connect me with a recruiter? So he connected with me with a recruiter by the name of Mary Ann Jambliakowski. Obviously, you know Mary Ann from, uh, from Boston. And I had to drive from Peoria, Illinois to Chicago to do a video interview in a strange system called Confreview. And I had to put together this brag book to say, why am I so good and why should I be great for, for the job? So I went through all the hoops and everything and then did a secret ride along with my friend to see what the job was really like, only to turn down the offer. Flash forward to uh, leaving Peoria, Illinois, going to Dallas for a year and a half, deciding that my uh, my girlfriend at the time that we wanted to become married, that we wanted to live somewhere that wasn't Dallas, that was not Peoria and was not going to be Chicago. That's way too cold for me. We settled on St. Louis. And when I came here, after working um, via sweat equity program with a direct mail franchise that um, I was very successful in Dallas, they gave me the opportunity to create a business here in town. After about six months, I had a life revelation that I was going to be fighting with mom and pop pizza shop for a $200 ad for the rest of my life. And I wasn't satisfied with that. So I had to think about what did I want to do? What could I be good at? How could I be of value? And I saw an ad in the St. Louis paper that was titled, If I Had a Brother or Sister. Now, I learned many years later that this was the very ad that the founder of MRI, Alan Schoenberg, used to get franchisees way back in the 60s and 70s and many years beyond. So I took an opportunity with, at the time, management recruiters of St. Louis, Westport, Office Mates 5, and Daystar. There's a mouthful for you, right? With the the incredible Phil Birch. Phil had started this franchise and become very successful in it and hired anyone who had sales aptitude, who was willing to put in a lot of sweat, a lot of time, and be willing to learn the way of the system and be willing to do it his way. There were not two ways. There was one way, and it was his way. And I was willing to do all of that. Flashing back to that story about Mary Ann, about two years later, I go to a conference. And it's one of the very first conferences where they combine the AEs and the CSAMs and the managers in the mecca of the country, Cleveland, Ohio. And I was walking down the hallway. I heard somebody say Mary Ann's name. And all starstruck, I went up to her. I told her the story. 
And then after I told her the story, I let, I kind of buried the punchline that I turned down the job. I don't know if you remember that. She goes, I don't remember that. And now I'm mad at you. <laughs> but after me buying her a drink at the bar later that night, all was forgiven. And she became a, a, a wonderful person uh, that has, I mean, done incredible things uh, before she retired. But it all started with a friend getting a job in pharmaceutical sales that exposed me to the recruiting business. And that exposure, when I was deciding what did I want to do, where I wanted to have an impact via sales, recruiting became that, that, that avenue. So let's continue on with the AE vision. Yeah. You're in it. Obviously, it felt right. It it just inspired you to come to work every day. Mm -hmm. What about that office was the inspiration? It was a performance culture. There was the buzz in the room. There was the expectations from everybody. And the simple expectation was do whatever you had to do to make however many calls you needed to make to find a company who was willing to interview your candidate. And then do it again, and then do it again, and then do it again. And I was very, very fortunate, and I will say unequivocally, absolutely lucky, because it was not skill, that I made a placement seven days on the job. Oh I God. didn't mention the word fee. I did not clear the salary, but I got a hiring manager who said, okay, I'll interview him. And I had to go into Phil's office for him to help me go um, put my head between my legs and call the HR manager after dealing with the engineering manager to go, um, yeah, there's a fee involved with this. So uh, there was no skill in that, but the, the, the effort was there. And then for the next six months, I made a placement every three weeks. And it was purely from Getting the that first taste of success, realizing, oh, yeah, I can do this, that I can sell over the phone because my theory was I have to be in front of somebody. I have to be able to see them face to face in order for me to be successful and to walk them down the path that was the lo next logical step being the sale being closed. So it was a little bit of a leap of faith. That turned out pretty well in those first six months. But then the typical rookie elements happened. <laughs> I started getting smarter than everybody else in the room. I started thinking, dang, they're doing it that way. Why can't I do it this way? And I started taking shortcuts and trying new things. And shocker of all shockers, went in a little bit of a slump. And about 45 days into that slump, I got some send outs along the way. So I wasn't a complete deadbeat during that time, but nothing was going together. Shocker, be again, because of the shortcuts I was taking. So that's where I had to make the decision. Did I have the, the decision that, you know what? I just can't do this anymore. That was just dumb luck. Or do I go into Phil's office and say, yeah, my shortcuts didn't work. How can I get right back on the, the right path? And fortunately, that was in 1998. I did that. I went back in. I had that conversation. I let him tear apart everything that I was doing so I can get back to the foundations of the business. Because you and I both know that take technology away, the foundations of this business haven't changed since 1965. For the most part, they are still the same. So I went back to those basic principles and was very, very fortunate to turn that year around and hit pace setter in my first full year with the company. But it took that, that decision by me that, okay, there is the right way to do it. And there's a lot of wrong ways. I've tried the wrong ways now. Now let's go back. Now let's go back to the right way. Boy, I wish every account executive in our system could hear that story. I really do because, it, look, we all make mistakes. Yeah. Um, you figuring this out in the first six months, I tell people all the time that tenure causes problems. Yeah. 
because we all get to where you were in six months. Most mm-hmm. of us, it takes a year or two or something like that because success just breeds content. Yep. Well, we, to, we, oh, we have an old saying that you either have five years of experience or you have five one years of experience. Well said. Well said. You owning that and your transparency with the reflection in the mirror is what's led you to be so doggone successful. I mean, you've demonstrated that in so many ways of your life, Chris. I've known you forever. And and you've just demonstrated that in so many ways of your life that it's just an honor to call you a friend. It really is. You likewise, buddy. Thank you. The Now we fast forward, and I know at one point you decided you wanted to venture out on your own. In fact, there was a couple of you at that time that decided Mm -hmm. you want to venture out on your own. And whatever be the reason, you came back to Phil. And long story short, um, the, the operation had to change hands. Yep. And you stepped up. Yep. Today as president, do you lead your people the same way that you were led? Yes and no. I lead them with compassion. I lead them with care. I don't necessarily lead them with the micromanagement that was the way of the times in the 90s and early 2000s. I treat them like big boys and big girls because they're adults and that has paid off in spades with the small but mighty team that I have right now. I mean, think of the time over the years that Westport one has been, I mean, we've been as, as large as uh, 35 people and be a $5 million office. Westport one, as of this moment is a team of five and we're going to do somewhere between a million and a million half. So it's a far cry from that. But I feel really good about the team that I have, how we work together, and I help them as much as they help me. What keeps you involved with them with a smaller team? Alan Schoenberg used to say, and I remember him telling me this personally, you know, the most successful, most profitable offices are four to six size. Mm -hmm. And you're right in the middle of that. Yep. And, And it allows you to engage with your people personally yeah a lot more some people might call it micromanage but it's all in a style you've created a culture of success mm-hmm. keep that going keep well, that going that. Yeah. so as an owner making the switch because this there's a lot of people going to see this right that are account executives that are in the process of next gen and mm-hmm. so forth what did you struggle with taking over the corporation. Yes. When, when I first took over, I had all wonderful plans of how I was going to change everything, but nothing really needed to change other than who was signing the check at the end of the day. The biggest challenge was the economics. Is you have to be prepared financially to run the business without running scared. And I learned the hard way the first time around that a shoestring is not a good string to be playing with. (laughs) (laughs) And I also learned that I need to be involved in the practice of the business, meaning being on a desk, because I truly believe at this size of an operation, it's important for me to be in a production role Because the reality is what I produce goes to the bottom line. And I can do that. And I could also share stories and real world examples, real term, real time situations with the team that aren't theory, that aren't from 20 years ago, that are from 20 minutes ago. And with this this size of team, I think that's really, really critical. Now, are your people working in office or are they remote? Well. Pre-COVID, we were 100% in the office, 8.30 to 5.30, 
And if you made a call on your cell phone after hours, that didn't count (laughs) because it wasn't at your desk. COVID happened. Obviously, we all know what happened, that everyone had to go remote. And we had a, a very short burst of quick success in the remote capacity that my theory that I had a long conversation many times over with Phil turned into reality. And it was in an offhanded joke that I would say it. Because the theory was if they aren't at their desk, they aren't they don't have a chance to be successful because they aren't there in the heat of everything around them. And my theory was if you have the right people, they're going to succeed wherever they are, whether they're at their desk in the office, whether they're at their desk at home, whether they're sitting with their laptop at the pool or whether they're sitting with a laptop at the beach. And on the flip side, if they want to goof off, they're going to goof off just as easily at their desk in the office as they would at home or at the beach. So let's treat them like adults and believe in them, but trust and verify. So when COVID happened and we flipped to a remote environment and we had some initial success, we realized this can work. So our lease came up. We decided not to renew it. And now I'm very, very happy that our entire team is remote. And I have more satisfied team members. I have one member of the team that's in Kansas City. We're in St. Louis. That'd be a pretty long commute every day. That she wouldn't be able to be on the team if if it was just the physicality of an office here in the St. Louis area. Um, But I've really, really worked hard to create the same culture or at least a similar enough culture that we had in the office in a virtual environment. And a couple of things that I've done is I keep the same meeting schedule. We do everything that we did in the office, meeting Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we do them the same way. I don't care how experienced the team gets. And I got, I'm got i fortunate to have a, uh, a six-year, a seven-year, and a three-year uh, with, with us. But we keep that, that um, rhythm, that cadence of the meetings Maybe they're only 15 minutes long. Maybe they go up to 30 minutes long. If I'm showing one of the videos from corporate, like the the uh, the CPP one with Alex from a, from a couple of days ago, that's 45 minutes. So I just let the team know in advance. But we keep that type of cadence because it keeps some consistency and it keeps the ability for the camaraderie. Where we're able to start out the meeting in the same way we would if we, we if we were sitting around a conference table of a little bit of the chit chat, a little bit of the banter, a little bit of the ribbing. We're able to do all of that just in a virtual sense. And I can truly say with each of my AEs that are in a virtual environment, that theory also turned into reality that the time that they are no longer spending commuting, every single one of them is spending that time in the desk, on their desk. If it just happens to be at their basement, on a desk in their bedroom, or somewhere in their house. So it's a win for us. It's a win for them. It's a win for their families. It's a win for my families and my beagles because <laughs> I get to be around them too. That's so awesome. it's really worked out well for us. And I know that's not for everybody, but it's worked well for us. No, I, you know, the comment that it's not worked out for everybody, that goes without saying. I mean, the reality is, is some people work way better in an accountability environment. Some people work really well by themselves. I mean, I've known people that have worked remote probably after the third month mm-hmm. and they're 20 years into the business and, and very, very successful. It's all about being accountable to yourself. That's right. Distractions destroy our business. Yeah. They really yeah. do. And, it, and that's hard when you're working by yourself. So let's talk a little bit about technology, because since you started with this business, technology has advanced as a slug to a rocket ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) How do you manage keeping technology as a tool and not a distraction? Uh, that's a, a uh, double-edged sword <laughs> um, of it of its own. And I mean, and you know me, Vince. I mean, how many meetings have I given where I've been up on the stage talking about technology, whether it's social media, this or that, and the powers and the capabilities of it? But 
Technology does not make a recruiter. Technology is there to help create the power of the recruiter by helping them do things with a little more efficiency. When now with the advent of AI, maybe every now and then a little smarter than they really are. But it's helped to really streamline what they do. And the, 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 the double-edged sword of that is if they rely too much on technology, pick your poison of what technology we're talking about. But if they rely too much on it, then they, re, they, they lose the human element. And this is a business from the beginning of time until I truly believe until the end of time, there will always be the human interaction. And that is the thing that keeps this profession of recruiting going and going and going. It is not just sending an email. It's not just sending a text. It's not recording a video and sending it off in a, in a mass email stream. It's not being the greatest name on LinkedIn or on Twitter uh, for uh, what you do or funny videos you create. All of that helps create your brand. But it's what you do with that in your interaction, in your discourse with clients and with candidates that's going to keep this business around forever. Oh, and building a relationship with somebody via voice. That's right. It's it, the fees that we charge, that we get paid, and the ability to earn those fees can't be done over technology. No. It has to be done face-to-face -face or on telephone. But that's, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I truly believe in it. Yeah, we're going to have one or two like that. I mean, I mean, I've always loved the little stories where, and we've had several of them over the years where 100% of the communication was between email and text. And usually that was impact player driven or MPC driven, whatever name you want to give it, where you had a candidate, you literally got their voicemail, you left them a message, they returned the voicemail. And they got your voicemail. They said, I'd love to talk to them. You send over the resume. They shoot you a text for the time. You respond with a text. You try to call them. They don't return the call, but they return the text. They say they want to give an offer. They won't tell you what the number is over the phone, but they'll give it to you via text. You call the candidate. The candidate goes, I already got a call from the company. Not, not the process we set up, of course, but I already got a call from the company. They're giving me an offer and I've accepted. You're like, great, let's talk about it. Oh, I'm starting a week from Tuesday. Never experienced that. We, <laughs> Congratulations. We've had a couple of those. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so where what is your dig? What is does your whole office is it in the same dig or do you have multiple digs? Uh something that Phil did that I have uh kept as a consistency because I wholeheartedly believe in it is diversified by design. So we have four different digs uh within the office. Um, I personally work the desk of senior living, so senior living leadership across the country. We have a healthcare leadership desk. We have an IT desk, primarily on the development side. And then we have a, I'll lump it into financial services, but it's in the trust wealth management um, a, a sector of that financial services. So we have those four. And the reason I say by design is because you and I have seen offices over the years that were in one sector. And if that sector had significant challenges, we didn't see those offices around that long. So by being diversified, one may be going good, another one may have maybe having some softness, and another one may be having a real trouble. But from an organization standpoint, there is still some continuity. So the revenue is still coming in to keep the office going. That's great. That's great. So what do you look for in a client? Mm -hmm. I want to focus on the client first. Yeah. What do you look for in a client that gains your trust into wanting to work with them? The most important thing is that they laugh at my jokes. If they do that, <laughs> everything else is fine. <laughs> but <laughs> seriously, what I really look for is someone that values what we do. And they have to value it without re a real validation up front. Because it's all the words I tell them is one thing. All the case studies I could share with them is one thing. But until they actually experience it, it is a leap of faith. 
So I'm looking for a client that is willing to trust our success, our methodology will work for them. So that's one of the first things I'm looking for. The other one that I'm looking for, and uh, sometimes it becomes a um, uh, a said up front as an absolute and it doesn't necessarily follow through, is someone that will follow a reasonable process. I've uh, kind of screamed from the rooftops uh, one or a thousand times in the senior living space about having a process makes the difference in getting the candidate that is actually going to be successful versus just getting a live body. And there have been some that have taken that to heart and have changed their processes because of the recommendations from the experiences we've had with good and bad processes. So if I have someone who will take that leap of faith and I have someone that will follow a process, we're pretty successful with them. And then it's on us. Then it's on us to find the right talent for them. Not just to shove the first person we find in their face and try to convince them at all costs to hire them, but to go through a diligent process with speed and efficiency to find them the right candidates so that they have choice. And I'm a big believer in choice. One candidate is not a choice. It's a decision. Two or three or four is a choice. And if you give them that type of choice and you make the decision difficult for them, Sit back and relax because the placement's going to happen. Good call. Good call. Now let's flip it. Yeah. Because one of the struggles for recruiters out there is you can't do a DNB on candidates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so credibility is, is a little more at jeopardy with candidates. Yep. So for our audience, mm -hmm. what do you do? To vet your candidates to, number one, know that you can trust what you're presenting to the client. Well, one of the very first things, you know, I'll, I'll talk, it from the, talk about it from the perspective of we're speaking to them about a, a, a specific search. So we're actually recruiting them for a role. The first element of trust that I'm looking for that uh, with candidates and all of our recruiters are looking for is that trust element. Because we don't hide who the company is. And the reason that is a bigger statement than some offices, 99% of what we do is on a contingent basis. But we've been a big believer that if I can't trust you enough to tell you who the company is, and if I have a fear that you're going to go around me, so I'm going to keep that a secret, or on the flip side with a hiring manager, I'm going to bl blind out the resume because I don't trust you enough to send you the resume with the full information. If either of those are in play, shouldn't be working with either of them. So that's it's, it's a hoop they jump through. But once we gain some, we gain a validation that there's that there's interest. Mm -hmm. Going back to that technology, for the most part, we have a basic uh, template when we're calling many of them from their LinkedIn profile. Whether the search was done on LinkedIn or whether it was a raw recruiting call. We could still, in 13 seconds or less, pull them up on LinkedIn and have a pretty basic understanding of their background. So we're going to have a basic understanding of whether they have most of the skills that we're looking for. But whether they're truly interested, that's the trigger point when we're going to tell them who the company is. So that, that's the first element. The, the rest of the elements are the trust and process again, that cooperation. A line that I've told candidates is there's only one cost to you and it's not dollars and cents. The only cost to you is cooperation. So can I get your commitment that you will respond quickly in a reasonable time? I'm not telling you to stop doing what you're doing when you're at your job, but if I send you a text, will you respond in a reasonable time? And will you be brutally honest with us? A no is okay. A yes is great, is I don't know is unacceptable. So if we totally have that agree. mutual agreement, we could be a great partner. So those are just so, some of the, the 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 verbiage that I might use with a, a candidate that I or I've I've talked with our team about to, to utilize with candidates. I love your definition of no and yes. To me, no is is great. That's right. It really is. Yeah. I, but for me, no and yes is only a step 
to the next question. Yeah. Why? Yeah. That That's three letter true. word to me is the most powerful word in our business that we can use, whether it's with the clients or with the candidates. Why should candidates, clients, doesn't make any difference. Why should they work with your team? I think the greatest reason I could say of why a client, prospective client, or why a past client will come back to us or a prospective candidate should work with us is because we actually are trustworthy. And that's not a, a, a nice statement. It's a fact that we're going to do the right things. If we have a candidate, let's say we're talking on the hiring manager side and they have a critical opening. If we recruit a candidate and that candidate starts becoming squirrely, if we start learning things about that candidate that makes us believe that they may not be the right match for the role, we're going to pull them. And we'll tell that to a, to a candidate. And it's okay because we'd rather pull them early than have them go all the way down the process to, of, the, of, the, of the hiring process only to say no at the end. Or if there's something wild and, and crazy in the situation of a, something bad on, the, on a reference check, on a background check, minor things of embezzlement, things like that, we'd much rather pull them early on. And I, I would share that with a hiring manager that I reserve the right to remove a candidate from process if I don't feel they're in the best interest of your hire. So that's a trustworthy thing that we have actionable um, results from, that we have history of doing. And on the candidate side, it might rhyme, but our job is not to get somebody fired, it's to get them hired. So confidentiality is of the most utmost importance. In my almost 27 years now, we've never had a time where a candidate has called us and said, you dirty, rotten scoundrel. I just lost my job because you did a reference check too early or somebody blabbed to my boss that I was interviewing. And that was because we were trustworthy with their information and we kept it confidential. But the final thing that I'll say, and I'll say this to unequivocally, unequivocally to every member of our team is we really care about the industries we work in. And my senior living space that myself and my recruiting partner, Blake, in, we see the result of our placements not as an impact on the bottom line of the, bottom line of the company. That's a byproduct of the placement. But what we see that placement on is an impact on the residents in those communities. If we place an incredible executive director, yes, they're going to have to deal with profit and loss and team uh, and teams and hiring and firing, all the things that go in involve, being involved in running a community. But what we really want to know is, are they going to be out front and in the hallways and at the dining room tables with those residents and making a meaningful impact on those residents? That's what gets me going. So that type of care cannot be faked. It comes through the questions we ask. It comes through the candidates that we recruit. It comes from the openings that we get from our clients. And I would say that holds true in our other industries as well. Well, you do wear your heart on your sleeve, my friend. You every really now do. and then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, every now and then. <laughs> no, you do. And, and it's impressive. And and. It's a valuable asset. It really is. You put, you've put 27 years into this. The years is one thing. I know for a fact the hours you put in. Yeah. Building your name, building your brand, building your desk. Now contributing to build, helping your team build their desks and so forth. What does Chris Hines do to unwind, to clear the brain? To let loose, a couple different things. One thing that you know all too well uh, that I, I I like to move my feet a little bit. <laughs> I run every day. Um, in a month from now, I'll run every single day for four years. 
but it's about movement. It's, it's, it does, like you say, it clears my mind, but it also feeds my mind. We're doing a podcast right here. I am probably one of the biggest digesters of podcasts that I've ever known because I listen to them at one and a half speed. So if I'm out for a 45 minute or an hour or two or three or a four hour run, I consume a lot of content. So while I might be clearing my mind of the challenges and allowing me to think through things, I'm also feeding my mind with whether it be posit- positivity, inspiration, uh, industry, industry insight, but so much that I could learn and glean from the episodes that I'm listening to, never watching because I'd be dangerous to run and try to watch a video at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one thing that I do to clear my mind. Uh, the other is my family. We love to travel. So it, it kind of falls in that category of the work hard, play hard. Uh, but my wife and I have always had the belief that you, while you have to balance this with a little bit of reason, we would rather be enjoying life now than hoping we're going to enjoy our lives when we retire. Because we've seen too many family members, friends of family members who worked their tail off and never stopped working their tail off until they retired. And then whether it was medically, whether it was physically, they weren't able to do the things that they would hope that they can do. So we love to travel together. We're big Disney fans. So usually Disney's always in the mix at least once or twice or four times a year. (laughs) We love to go on adventures. We love to use my running as an excuse to go on an adventure. But those are things that really get us going. Boy, what a great story. Don't ever change, Chris. Try not to. Please don't ever change. The, your character exemplifies your success. Just don't ever change. Chris, I want to thank you very, very much for taking the time out of your busy day to spend it here. I'm hoping that the people that see this get an inside look to Chris Hines, what drives you, who you are. I hope they reach out to you. I really do. I appreciate that, Vince. Thank you. Thank you again. I really appreciate your time.